everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to continue our look at the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919. And we're going to see if there are any similarities or lessons to be learned for our current pandemic of COVID-19. In our first episode, we looked at how the flu spread amongst the training camps in the heartland of America, and then was transferred with the troops to the front lines of Europe, and from there spread throughout the world. But by July and August, the flu seemed to be dying down. It hadn't been that bad of a disease so far. It just sickened a lot of people. But the worst was yet to come. Let's cue up the music and look at the second wave. Now, the first wave of the Spanish influenza was known as the three-day fever. It was a very contagious disease and sickened many people, but didn't kill that many. But it did tie up support personnel and decreased the available manpower and actually interfered with combat operations in the summer of 1918 for the American Expeditionary Force. But by July and August, it seemed to be dying down and the medical officers in the Army and the Navy breathed a sigh of relief. Then the flu virus does what flu viruses do. It mutated and it became an extremely virulent form and went back from Europe to the United States. Camp Devon was a military facility about 35 miles northwest of Boston. This is where the troops went that arrived in Boston. On September 1st, the 1,200-bed hospital at Camp Devon's had 84 patients. On September 7th, a soldier was admitted with delirium and very high fever. At first, he was thought to have meningitis. Within a day, 12 more of his barracks mates were admitted with similar symptoms. The evaluation for meningitis came up negative and they were re-diagnosed with influenza, but of a very severe form. Dr. Roy Grist, a physician at the hospital at Camp Devens, described the typical patient. They would come in with signs of severe flu. They would be at times delirious. They had such severe body aches that they thought it may have been dengue fever, also known as breakbone fever for obvious reasons. Within two hours, they would develop a very severe pneumonia and start coughing up a bloody, frothy sputum. Then as their lungs filled up with fluid, their oxygen levels would drop and they would become cyanotic. They would turn blue. Death would follow within a few hours. At the height of the outbreak at Fort Devens, 1,500 soldiers a day were reporting sick and they were having more than 100 deaths every day. Within a couple of weeks, the hospital at Fort Devens, which was built for 1,200 patients, had more than 6,000 soldiers. All the hallways were filled with cots, and the medical staff, the doctors and the nurses, began to sicken as well. Eventually, they had to close the hospital, and soldiers that became sick had to remain in the barracks. Camp Devens was put on quarantine in an effort to stop the epidemic. However, a group of officers traveled from Camp Devens to Fort Grant in Illinois, bringing with them the influenza. Within days of their arrival, Fort Grant was also experiencing an epidemic of patients with similar symptoms. However, Camp Grant was not immediately put on quarantine as well. A train carrying 3,000 soldiers left Camp Grant and traveled to Augusta, Georgia, stopping at towns along the way on the 1,000-mile trip. By the time the train arrived in Augusta, Georgia, 2,000 of the 3,000 soldiers on the train required hospitalization. The second wave of the Spanish influenza had arrived in the United States. Now, several things combined together to prime the United States and by extension the rest of the world for a pandemic. The military drafted half the nurses and doctors under the age of 45 into military service. These were the youngest and in most cases the best trained physicians in the country. The doctors that were left were many years out of their training and not capable of handling an epidemic of this proportion. The war also led to something called the Sedition Act. It was a 20-year felony to say or publish information that could be viewed as hurting the war effort, such as a major epidemic sweeping the country. This is why this became known as the Spanish flu. Spain was a neutral country and not under these restrictions. 
The outbreak of the flu was not even mentioned in internal documents until April of 1918, and it was not mentioned in the newspapers until August of 1918, when it was thought to be over. This is best exemplified by the experience in Philadelphia. Ships returning from overseas brought the second wave of the Spanish influenza to the Philadelphia Naval Yard. This resulted in a small outbreak that seemed to be localized to the Naval Yard itself. In fact, the director of public health in Philadelphia, a gentleman by the name of Wilmer Crewson, was quoted in the newspapers as saying, he would confine this disease to its present limits, and in this we are sure to be successful. In other words, we had a couple of cases that were going to be going away shortly, and we had everything under control. When COVID-19 first showed up in Oregon and infected about 15 people, the President of the United States got on television and said words that are eerily reminiscent of those of Mr. Crewson. As they get better, we take them off the list so that we're going to be pretty soon at only five people, and we could be at just one or two people over the next short period of time. The day after his announcement, two sailors died in the Naval Yard. Mr. Crewson was again quoted saying that this was not the Spanish flu, it was just regular old influenza. They had everything under control. The next day, 14 more people died, including one civilian. It had come off the naval base. Crewson again was quoted in the newspaper saying, it's okay, we'll nip this in the bud. Spanish influenza had widely spread throughout military camps across the country. It was bad enough that on September 26th, the United States stopped conscription. Meanwhile, back in Philadelphia, there was a quota to sell Liberty Bonds. Local and military physicians urged Mr. Crewson to cancel the parade, thinking that hundreds of thousands of people packing the sidewalks make the epidemic explode. Mr. Crewson refused to do so. The physicians wrote letters and contacted newspapers. The letters were not published. No reports were printed in the newspaper for fear of running afoul of the Sedition Act. The parade went on as scheduled. Within two days of the parade, people began to fill up the hospitals with flu symptoms and delirium. Mr. Crewson again went into the papers and said, don't panic over exaggerated reports. Crewson went on to say that scientific nursing would handle this with no problem. We'll have trained nurses go out and everything will be okay. The population asked for nursing visits. Of 3,100 requests for nursing visits, there were only enough nurses to cover 198 of them. Finally, Mr. Crewson ordered the schools to be closed and public gatherings to be halted. But it was too late. The outbreak was in full swing. Up to 750 people died a day of the Spanish flu, 12,000 in total in Philadelphia alone. At Camp Pike in Arkansas in October of 1918, over 8,000 patients were admitted with the flu over a four-day period. The newspapers reported it was only the grip, a little influenza, nothing to worry about. In San Antonio, Texas, 53% of the population came down with the Spanish flu. Coffins were in such short supply that funeral homes, which had raised their prices 500%, actually hired armed guards to protect their supplies. People in general suffered from this lack of leadership. They didn't know what to do. They weren't getting accurate information. And in situations like that, people tend to pull into their own family groups. Children whose parents were dying of influenza could not be placed in homes. Nobody would take them. Calls for volunteers to bring food to people went unanswered. People starved because they were too sick to cook, much less go shopping. In one native village in rural Alaska of 80 people, 72 of them died of the flu. Many of those died because there was nobody to take care of them. They were all sick themselves or they all just gave up. The village ceased to exist. They were all buried in a mass trench. Back in Philadelphia, the bodies would stack up. There was nobody to come take them away. Finally, local clergymen would get horse-drawn wagons and go through the streets calling out for people to bring out their dead, reminiscent of the Black Death of the Middle Ages. Individual burials had long since ceased, and the bodies were put in large trenches. 
The need for medical services was so overwhelming that they actually had medical students running wards in hospitals. I found this rather alarming because the other day, Governor Cuomo in New York signed a bill allowing senior medical students to begin practicing to respond to the COVID-19 emergency in his state. These are echoes of the Spanish influenza. Unlike Philadelphia, certain cities did adopt good public health measures, basically social distancing. Cities like San Francisco were hit nowhere near as hard as Philadelphia was, but that will be the subject of another video. Once again, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Next week, we'll have a look at the third and final wave of the Spanish influenza, which occurred in the spring of 1919. I hope you'll be able to join me. Until then, stay safe and take care.